In this lecture, we're going to learn about the deflection of beams. Now here I've drawn a cantilevered beam with a load on the end. And what I mean by the deflection of beams is the, the downward or the wide direction movement of the beam due to the loads. So if we can imagine that uh, this cantilevered beam has this load on the end, we can think of what the, the beam would look like if that load was applied to it it would probably deflect down something like this. And I'm exaggerating this deformation. Uh, I couldn't quite draw the beam to the, the same size as I had initially. The idea is, uh, think of like a yardstick. If you hold a yardstick, one end of it on the table, and you push down on the other end with your hand, you have a situation that's very similar to what we're looking at here. It's a cantilevered uh, beam. Now, our reference point for beams uh, that we know from stresses in beams is the neutral axis. That's also going to be the reference point for our deflection of the beam. So when we talk about the deflection of the beam, we're not talking about the movement of the top surface. What we're talking about is the movement of the neutral axis. So there's the undeformed neutral axis that I sketched in there. And down this way is the deformed neutral axis that I'm sketching in right now in the blue color. And the distance from where the neutral axis used to be to where the neutral axis is now, every point along the length of that beam, is the beam deflection. And we call that uh, symbol little v for beam deflection. And we'll talk about these uh, in a little bit uh, more detail in a few more minutes. If you remember our coordinate system for our beams, the y direction is vertically up, and the x direction goes down the neutral axis this way. So we can tell by looking at this picture that the deflection v is a function of x. And so that just means that the deflection depends on x. Sometimes we're going to be interested in the deflection at particular points along the length of the beam. Sometimes we're going to be interested in the deflection uh, that's the maximum for the beam, and usually the maximum magnitude. Just like a lot of the other quantities that we've been looking at, there is a sign associated with deflection. A downward deflection, that means in the negative y direction, is a negative deflection. An upward deflection in the positive y direction is a positive deflection. We're going to be able to use mechanics and materials to determine the deflection anywhere along the length of this beam. There's another term that we'll talk about called the slope, and that's the angle that the neutral axis makes from the horizontal. Okay, let's uh, let me draw one more picture here, and uh, we'll try to make this very clear what our coordinate system is looking like. So here's a, a beam that I'm just trying to draw that's undeflected. You can think of it like our cantilevered beam again. But in this case, I'm going to put a load uh, going upward. I'm going to dash it in. This is not a free body diagram, but it's just a uh, schematic. And if it was fixed over here on the left-hand side, then the neutral axis would come into the wall at this angle. There it is, undeformed. And let me use my blue color again. Then the neutral axis would deflect and take a shape, something like that. All right, so X goes down the length of the beam, and Y is positive up. If we look at a particular spot, then this would be V of X in the positive direction. And then the slope, if we look at that particular point right here, 
the angle that that makes from the horizontal is the slope theta, which you can see from that picture also is a function of x. Slope also has a sign associated with it. If we think of our coordinate system looking like this, x and y, a positive slope goes from x to y. A negative slope goes the other way. And of course, just to write it down, uh, positive deflection is upward. Now, if you notice, we've used the symbol V previously when we talked about the shear force in a beam. That's capital V. Uh, our book uses little v for beam deflection. Some people use Y. Uh, but our book uses little v for beam deflection, and I will try very hard to make sure that I make my capital V's look like capital V's and my little v's look like little v's. Uh, but sometimes you may have to rely on the context of what's being talked about. Now it may not look like it, but we've also we've already uh, dealt with something that kind of deals with the deflection of beams. And if you remember our moment curvature relationship when we talked about stresses in beams was m is equal to e i divided by the radius of curvature rho. Uh, and we said that if we had a beam with a pure moment on it, then that curls up, and the distance from the center of curvature to the neutral axis of the beam uh, is that distance rho. It creates a circular arc. So if our beam started out flat, there's our original neutral axis, and it curls up into this arc, it kind of makes sense that the deflection upward has something to do with where the beam is located along its length, where the point on the beam is located along the length, and the value of that radius of curvature. Now, previously we had talked about a uh, single bend, and you worked some problems that uh, were steel bands wrapped around drums and things like that. But it turns out that all of the quantities in this expression can depend on x. So the moment can change with x, and the radius of curvature can change with x. For us, we're going to leave the product of E and I constant. So the moment can change with position x, and this radius of curvature can change with uh, x, but we're going to take e and i equal to a constant. So deflection is kind of related to this uh, radius of curvature. We'll investigate that in a little bit more detail shortly. But it also turns out that slope and deflection can be related to one another too. Let's think about that figure back on the previous page, or we can look at this one too, where we have this radius of curvature rho going to the deflected neutral axis. And we have a point on here, and the, the angle that this makes at that point, that tangent point, is the angle of the slope uh, of the beam theta. Now if we think about it, we can construct a right triangle where the horizontal distance, the run, is a small change in length along the beam. I'm exaggerating these deformations to make the picture clear. And at the same time as it's moving a little bit along the length of the beam, we're getting some small increment of deflection in that direction. If we make this a right triangle, we can see that the tangent, this angle theta, is equal to this dv by dx. Or we can rewrite this the other way, uh, the the angle, the slope, theta, is the inverse tangent of this dv by dx, the rise over the run. Now, in the kind of problems that we're going to be looking at, we're going to be de dealing with uh, 
steel, concrete, glass, fairly stiff materials. For stiff materials under common engineering loads, you tend not to have a big change in deflection over a small increment of beam. So for us, this dv by dx term is going to be small. And the way that you'd say that in, uh, in math terminology, you'd use the symbol with two less than signs to mean much less than uh, 1. And if this is much less than 1, when we take the inverse tangent of it, if you're in radians, <clears throat> you tend to get back the angle theta. So then the slope is going to be approximated by dv by dx. And this is also uh, another way to think of this. Instead of the rise or the run, it's the derivative of the deflection equation with respect to x. So I'm going to write that this way as v prime. So now we have a relationship between the deflection and the slope in a beam. Somehow we need to get uh, this curvature related to the deflection as well. Now the way that comes in is from something called the moment curvature relation from calculus. I'm going to write this down. If you've taken calculus, I'm sure you've seen this before. You may not remember it, depending on how much you used it. But if you have an arc and you find the radius of curvature of that arc. 1 over the radius of curvature is related to the second derivative of that function with respect to x, divided by this quantity on the bottom that I'm going to write down here, 1 plus the first derivative squared to the 3 halves power. Now for us, uh, we can simplify this down. We just said that the first derivative with respect to x is much less than 1. So when we square that, if you think of uh, 0.01, if you square 0.01, you get 0.001. And when you add a really small number to 1, you get pretty much 1. And when you take 1 to the 3 halves power, you still get 1. So for us we're going to end up with an approximation that we're going to make is that 1 over the radius of curvature is pretty much equal to, for us, the second derivative of the deflection equation with respect to x. And I will often uh, note that as v double prime. If we go back and look at our moment curvature relation again, where we had m is equal to ei divided by rho. If we make that substitution, now we're going to write m is equal to eiv double prime. And typically I would write this the other way around. eiv double prime is equal to m. Now what this is saying is that we have on the left-hand side of this equation I just wrote the bending stiffness the product of the material stiffness and the moment of inertia, which we're going to take to be constant, times the second derivative of the deflection equation is equal to the moment equation. And that depends on x. If we want to find the deflection equation, we're going to first integrate the moment equation once, and we get v prime, which happens to be the slope. And if we integrate that one more time, we're going to get the deflection equation v. Let's write that down on the next page. So we're going to start off with EI 
V double prime is equal to M. If E and I is constant, if we integrate this once, we'll get EI times V prime. But since V prime is the slope, we can also write it this way. EI theta is equal to an integral of M dx. And uh, right now this looks like uh, an indefinite integral, but we'll actually be evaluating it. So we'll need to end up with a constant of integration. If we integrate this again, we get EIV, the deflection, and we'll have an integral of the integral of m dx plus c1 and a second constant of integration. This is known as the second order integration method to find the beam deflection. There is a uh, fourth order method that uh, we're not going to get into, but you can, if you think about it, the, the third derivative of the deflection equation is related to the shear force because the derivative of the moment is the, with respect to x, is the shear force. And uh, the fourth derivative of the deflection equation is related to the distributed load on a beam because the derivative of the shear force equation with respect to x is equal to the distributed load. In this class, we're going to stick mainly to the uh, second order method. So you'll see that uh, terminology in our book. Now we'll talk about how to find, find these constants of integration. But let's start off uh, with a basic example, and, and I think we'll see where all this uh, fits in. So here's our beam. We're going to look at a cantilevered beam, and we're going to find the deflection in the slope as a function of x, and we're going to find the maximum deflection. We have a cantilevered beam of length L with a load P on the end. One of the things that you notice about these problems is that they're all going to be in terms of symbols. And it can look kind of intimidating at first, but you have to, um, after you work a few of these, it won't be so bad. And uh, in fact, if you try to end up working some with, with numbers, those numbers actually get in the way. Uh, you have to trust me on that, but uh, it's easier in the end if we work these problems in terms of symbols. All right, the first thing we want to do is to draw a free body diagram. Uh, and uh, we can find our reactions. In general, that's what you'd need to do. Okay, so here's my free body diagram. I have a load on the end. To keep this in equilibrium, I have to have an equal and opposite load here. I'll go through the statics kind of quickly. And I'll have to have a moment at the wall that would be end up equal to P times that length L. I'm going to have my coordinate system here. If you're going to get the answer in the back of the book, you need to use the coordinate system that the book gives you for their problems. The next thing we need is to find the moment as a function of position X. Now, let me make something clear here, is that the moment at the wall is not the moment as a function of X. That is a constant. That is the reaction at the wall. What we need to do is we need to cut this at some position, arbitrary position X, in this beam and draw a free body diagram looking either to the right of the cut or to the left of the cut. So let's write this down. We're going to make a free body diagram at position X. I'm going to go to the right. Now from my coordinate system, starting at the wall to the cut is the distance x. The entire length of the beam is L. So that means that the part of the beam that's left is the distance L minus x. On this piece of beam, I have my applied load, P, and I have to put in my shear force, and my bending moment in, in their positive directions. Positive shearing force goes up, and a positive bending moment puts the top in compression on the uh, left side of our figure. Okay. It's very important to draw 
the V and the M in their positive direction. So let me make a little note of that. If you don't, then you'll end up with the wrong sign of the deflection in the end. This little spot that I cut at, I'm going to call that point O. We're going to find the internal moment. And to, to be very clear, let's call this M of X. Because that moment changes depending on how much of the beam we've cut off. So let's make this step three. We're going to find M of X. So if I do the summation of moments about that point O, by my sign convention, I'm going to go take this way as positive. Let's see, I'm going to have minus P times the distance L minus X minus M of X. That's not M times X, that's M of X. equal to zero for equilibrium. The shear force doesn't have any moment arm. I'm going to take my moments about point O. Now to avoid any confusion, I'm going to end up calling this M and I'm going to leave off the M of X. But when I do that, it's going to be implied that that moment is the internal moment that depends on position. So if I move this moment to the other side and solve for it, I'm going to have minus PL plus PX. If I rearrange this, then this can be plus PX minus PL. And I'm going to take that, and I'm going to set that equal to EIV double prime. Let me start over on a clean page, and we'll, we'll take it from here. All right, I want to leave my picture of my beam up here for a little bit. But now I have this equation, EIV double prime is equal to PX minus PL. If I integrate both sides... On the left-hand side, if I integrate V double prime, I end up with V prime. On the right-hand side, if I integrate with respect to X, I'm going to have PX squared over 2 minus PL times X plus a constant of integration. If I integrate this again, I'm going to have the deflection equation EIV. On the right-hand side, I'm going to have P x cubed over 6 minus pl x squared over 2 plus c1x plus c2. And I want to make a note here that the v prime is the exact same thing as the slope theta. Okay, now we have two constants of integration. We integrated it twice, so we have two constants. We need to figure out what those constants of integration are. Now, if you're in a class like dynamics to find kind of constants of integration, you often look at something called initial conditions. Usually that's when you integrate with respect to time. You have something starting at some particular time. Uh, here we're integrating with respect to a spatial position. So what we need to look for are something called boundary conditions. Something that happens on the boundary of the beam or the beam region that we're going to look at. Now, let's think about how this beam would deflect if we were to put this load on it. We drew this shape already, but the deflected neutral axis would probably come in here. Since this is wall, it's fixed. It doesn't move. comes in, and then it kind of arcs over like that. Again, I'm exaggerating that. But the point is, if this is fixed over here at the wall, and the wall doesn't move, that means for a fixed end, the deflection is equal to zero where the wall is at. And in this particular case, where our coordinate system is located, that's at position x equal to zero. The other thing that we notice, and it kind of makes sense if you think about it, is that deflection curve will go into the wall at a right angle so that the slope is equal to zero at x equal to zero. Or another way to say that is v prime is equal to zero wherever that wall is at x equal to zero. So knowing those values, I can plug in my known locations for v and v prime 
and I can find my constants of integration. Let's do this one for v prime is equal to zero at x equal to zero. I'm going to have from my top equation e i v prime, which goes to zero, is equal to, if x is equal to zero, we have zero minus zero plus c1. So this tells me that the constant of integration c1 is equal to zero. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. In this case, for the deflection equal to zero and x equal to zero, I use my second equation, my v equation. I put in zero for v, and I'm going to have zero for x. I already know c1 is zero, and this says c2 is equal to zero. Okay, so very straightforward. Sometimes they'll be zero like this, sometimes they won't. It just depends on how things work out. So to complete this problem, I need to find the uh, deflection equation. EIV is equal to PX cubed over 6 minus PLX squared over 2. If I want, I can solve for deflection. Um, and if you notice, this is, uh, excuse me, PLX squared over 2. If you notice, this is a cubic equation. So that's kind of interesting. For a cantilevered beam, this shape is a cubic. If I want the slope equation, I can solve for V prime, or theta, uh, rather than move the EI to the other side and make a fraction. I'm going to write it like this. The slope equation EI theta is P x squared over 2 minus P L x. Now, if you look at the answer key for the odd problems in the book, they're probably going to factor these up in some maybe unusual ways. Um, but uh, it'll be the same thing, and, and I won't worry so much about how you factor them on an exam. Now, the next thing we wanted to find was the maximum deflection of the beam. Now, if you remember from calculus, to find the maximum of a function, you take the derivative and set it equal to zero. And that's kind of handy because we have the derivative equation right here. The derivative equation of the deflection is the slope. So we take the slope equation and set it equal to zero. Uh, but wait a minute. Let's look at this beam. The place where we have zero slope we actually have zero deflection in this beam. Now there's a catch in calculus. Uh, in, in, uh, you probably came up with it, <clears throat> but you may not remember it. And the catch is, if you want to find the maximum value of a function, you look at the place where the derivative of the function is zero, or you looked at the end of the interval. Now in our case, for this particular beam, the maximum deflection occurs at the end of the interval, at the end of the beam. And the, the best way to, to get that is to draw a sketch of what you think the deflected neutral axis will look like, and it's very obvious. So if we want the maximum deflection, we're going to put in x equal to L. E i v is equal to p L cubed over 6 minus p l cubed over 2. If we move the ei and we reduce this down, we'll get minus p l cubed over 3 ei. And the magnitude of the maximum deflection then will be equal to p l cubed over 3 ei. It's kind of a, a famous result. It's just what you get when you have a cantilever beam with an end load. All right. We're going to take a look at one more example. Let's save this, but let's also write down what we said about where the maximum deflection in a beam can occur. All right. So the maximum deflection occurs where either the V prime, the derivative of the deflection equation, equals to zero, or at the end of the interval or the end of the beam for us. Now, uh, the way you can tell is if you draw the expect expected deflection curve 
to check to see which case happens. Now we're going to take a look at another example. And the other example we're going to look at is a simply supported beam that has a constant distributed load on it. Length of the beam is L. The value of the distributed load is W0. If you think about this case, it would have zero deflection at the pin and the roller if they don't move. And the beam would kind of bow down, take a shape like this. Now in this case, by sketching in this deflected, expected deflected neutral axis, if you notice, it goes flat here in the middle of this beam. And that is the place where we have the maximum deflection. So that would be where V prime is equal to zero, where you have maximum deflection. Well, let's set that example up, and we'll work through it and uh, see what the equations are for the deflection and the slope for this beam. All right, let's go through this example a little bit quickly. So here we have a uh, simply supported beam, a pen and a roller, with a constant distributed load. The length of the beam is L. Our coordinate system starts at the left side and goes to the right. With our steps, first thing we want to do is we're going to find our support reactions. So we're going to draw a free body diagram. Now, the statically equivalent force from a constant distributed load over the length of the beam is going to be W0 times L. I'm going to dash that in. And without going through the, the details of the statics, I think it's probably pretty easy to see that in this case, each of these support reactions are going to be W0 L over 2. <clears throat> they both share the load. Now, if this was not a constant distributed load, then uh, you'd have to go through the statics more carefully and figure out what those reactions were. Just like we had before, we're going to take and we're going to cut this thing at position X. And when I cut this thing at position X, remember that the distributed load on the beam is what we need to deal with. Do not just include the constant equivalent force. We need this distributed load. So the free body diagram that we're going to look at to find M of X is going to look like this picture where we have that portion of the constant distributed load. I have to draw my shear force and my bending moment in in their positive directions. On the right side of the cut, the shear force goes down, the bending moment puts the top in compression. This, these M and V are functions of X. They will change if you make X smaller or larger. Let's do the summation of moments about point O. We're going to have M plus W naught X times X over 2 in a statically equivalent force, W naught times X times the moment arm length of X over 2. In the positive direction. And taking away from that, we're going to have minus W naught L over 2, the reaction, times the distance X equal to zero for equilibrium. We're going to take and we're going to set this equal to EIV double prime. We need to solve that for M. Moving it to the other side, we'll have W naught L over 2 times X minus W naught X squared over 2. If we look at this, this is dimensionally consistent. We have L times X, that's a length squared term. We have an X squared term, which is another length squared term, and they're both multiplied by W naught, so we're dimensionally consistent. Let's integrate this once. We have EIV prime, V prime is the same as the slope, equal to W naught L over 2 X squared over 2 minus W naught X cubed over 6 plus 1 constant of integration. And integrating it again, oops, we have EIV, uh, not the prime, EIV equal to W naught L over 2 X cubed over 6 minus W naught X to the 4th over 24 plus C1X plus a second constant of integration C2. Now we need to look at our boundary conditions for the beam. 
The boundary conditions for this beam are a little bit different than the boundary conditions that we had for the cantilevered beam. The pin and the roller, they're actually both attached to the beam, prohibit any vertical deflection of the beam. We already sketched in what we thought the deflection curve would look like. The boundary conditions are x equal to 0, v is equal to 0, and x equal to l, v is equal to 0. So in this particular case, we're going to use the v equation twice. Sometimes you use v prime and v, sometimes you use the v equation twice. All right, so let's plug in those boundary conditions. So x equal to 0, v is equal to 0. I'm going to go to my v equation. I'm going to put in 0 for v. I'm going to put in 0 for x. Okay, it turns out that c2 is equal to 0. Okay, now I'm going to put in x equal to l and v is equal to 0. Go into my v equation again. 0 is equal to w naught l over 2 times l cubed over 6 minus w naught l to the 4th over 24 plus c1 l and I already know C2 is equal to 0, so I'm not going to write it down. So now I'm going to have, if I take this to the other side, w naught l to the 4th over 24 minus w naught l to the 4th over 12 is equal to C1 times L. So C1 is going to be equal to... Let's see, that'll get rid of, uh, this will make it to the cubed power. So W naught L cubed. Uh, I have over 24 minus a 12th. That's two 24ths. So I should have a minus W naught L cubed over 24 for my C1. Okay. So my deflection equation then would be this equation with the C1 and C2 plugged in. So EIV is going to be equal to W naught over 2 times L X cubed over 6 minus W naught X to the 4th over 24 plus a negative W naught L cubed over 24 times x. If I want to find my maximum deflection, I would set, in this case, my v prime is equal to 0. It would work out that it would be x equal to l over 2. It works out that way because this is an easy problem. In more complicated problems, if you have a triangular distributed load or anything more sophisticated, You'll have to go through the math. Don't trust just looking at the beam. Go through the math, and then you can find out where the maximum deflection occurs, where the slope is equal to zero. Then plug that value back in to find the maximum deflection.